So this is the 2016 Trust Synopsis. We do one uh, every couple of years, and I'm not too sure if the video from 2014 is still available. If you're a client in the audience, you might know that better than me. But it, if it's not, just ask uh, through our team, and they will, of course, make that available. This is the, this is the new one for 2016. I'll, if there's new cases that come through, I may do 2017. We'll just have to see. It's not, uh, not really sort of any point in just standing on stage each year giving you the same information. So I've tried to give you new information this year. For those of you who don't know me, I am a Gilligan Row partner. There's four of us now at the firm, and I'm the one that sits in the trustee services division, which of course means I have to have a couple of degrees to help you. I've got a law degree, and I've got a commerce degree, and I've got a great interest in tax. I'm a national presenter on all things money, including the economy and trust, because that's what makes the world go around. I mean, I know money's not the be-all and end-all, but it's right up there with oxygen, isn't it? I'm a firm believer that education gets you ahead, and that is one of the reasons why I created Money School back in 2012, and then Business School 2013, and finally Property School in 2014. So our Property School runs now, uh, you know, so I think there's two or three that run a month on different, uh, different nights. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that later on. But uh, there's brochures at the GRA table on Property School. I'm also an author. I've written uh, a couple of books on money and asset protection, and I'm now on to my third book, which is um, Women and Money, Mastering the Struggle, because, of course, I'm, I'm writing it from my own, uh, my own gender. You know, women, uh, you know, women have problems, don't they? They've got real issues. And, well, I don't mean real issues in that way. I mean, you know, there are issues that face women, and they are different issues, and often to a more severe degree than what, uh, what men face. So I thought that book would be very useful. It will get released originally, uh, first, first copy is through England, and then uh, heads into the States, and then over to Australia, and then finally into New Zealand. We're the last country to get that book. But Women and Money, and that will cover uh, really from... It's going to cover the reasons why women have uh, found it difficult in life to, to get ahead, and then it's going to really give lessons from cradle to grave, I suppose. Seeing I'm going to spend a little bit of time with you, I thought that I might share something about me personally. I've got a couple of um, favourite pastimes. You'll frequently find me running, and there was a lady the other day, one of our clients, who says to me, you just come from a run, and i just done... Uh, an hour and a half on, on the local treadmill. I enjoy running. I get, uh, get a lot of tension uh, gone with running, so do that pretty much every day. And when I get a chance to go away on holiday, when I'm allowed out from behind my desk, I like to scuba dive. I also have an interest in antiques along with John Rowe. How many people know John Rowe in the, in the partnership? Nobody? Come on, there must be somebody that knows JR. Anybody know John Rowe in here? I've got a couple of people. Okay, well, if you're a Gilligan Rowe uh, client, you'll know John Rowe and Matthew Gilligan. He loves, um, he loves antiques. I enjoy movies. That's a way for me to relax. And naturally, I like writing. I wouldn't be writing the books and the blogs that I write if I didn't enjoy that process. For those of you who want to contact me, there are my uh, telephone numbers. You have our office number and you have our cell phone number there if you want to take that down. And of course, it's really easy for an email address. All partners are the same, uh, our initials, and then uh, the GRA uh, logo after that. Okay, here's a couple of books that I've written. Family Trust 101. This is, of course, how you... It's all very well making money, but you've got to protect it, right? So Family Trust 101 will help you protect it. And if you really want to know how to get ahead, Money Secrets will help you on that. The books are available at the GRA table, and by filling out a form, all you've got to do is give us your name, your credit card number, okay, and we will uh, send those books to you. Now, I have to start on the legalese before I really move through to the main part of the presentation. This presentation is not meant to be uh, specific advice for you sitting in the audience. It's what we call uh, general advice or class advice. So we're only going to give you general concepts, and the concepts and the views that I give you aren't necessarily Gilligan Row or any of its employees or its partners, uh, but they are, they are indeed uh, representative a lot of the time of, of the thinking that occurs within our practice. You also need to know that nothing in this presentation is endorsed by the Financial Markets Authority, and before making any decision whatsoever, you should, of course, consult an authorised financial advisor. Does everybody in the audience understand these points that I've made and that if you want advice, you can just come and ask us? Does everybody get that? 
okay, I have to hear a much bigger yes to be able to move. Otherwise, the lawyers keep me at this point forever. <laughs> Does everybody understand that? Yeah. Excellent. Okay, we're off. The no next point that you need to take into account is the, uh, the slides that I'm about to uh, provide, the information on those slides. They are intellectual property, so I would ask for no photographs, no recordings, uh, and that includes anything on your cell phone. If you want to know something, we will gladly share that with you. Just ask us afterwards. Our agenda tonight is the economy, the New Zealand budget structures, and the topical trust issues that I have found pervading uh, our world in the last uh, couple of years. Let's think about the economy, because there's an awful lot going on in the economy at the moment, and it affects your money, and that affects your trust. So the New Zealand economy. It's no, it's no news, is it? Really old news, in fact, that interest rates are historically low. Money is so cheap. House prices have risen, and of course, when that happens, individuals feel very wealthy, and they go out and they consume credit, they borrow, and then they buy. Retailing is therefore up. And of course, everything to do with retailing moves as well. So for example, that uh, transportation and shipping, construction. Has anybody tried to find a builder or a gardener? Four times I've gone out to my house recently and tried to find a gardener to put a garden in. Anybody in this audience knows of a really good landscaper, please send me the details tomorrow because I am struggling to find somebody. Construction and everything to do with construction has definitely um, pushed through the barriers of growth, that's for sure. And in fact, it would grow even more if they had the labour. I was talking two days ago to a developer who is trying really hard to get his hands on a crane. He's been waiting and waiting for a crane to get things moving. It used to be that you could book a, a concrete truck and they would be there within you know, a couple of days. Now try three weeks. Construction is really booming in our economy. And employment data has got a bit of a lift. You can see that, and it needs it, by the way. Tourism and associated industries, of course, have all been uh, a driver of employment because they are on the increase as well. And the New Zealand dollar has, uh, has climbed. And it, does, it shows no signs, really, of abating, I don't believe, especially with what's going on in England at the moment. We're all waited with bated breath on the, um, on the referendum tomorrow. The dollar is up, and that's simply because our economy looks better than anybody else. That's why they like to buy the New Zealand dollar. Whilst we've got more, um, more people in employment, okay, wage growth has, uh, it either hasn't occurred or if it has, it's been very slow. And that is because there's a large supply of labour that's come through, especially through migration, which employers can choose from. And so, of course, you've got subdue wage growth. That, of course, keeps uh, inflation down. It certainly doesn't allow it to, to grow that much. Dairy is down. It's likely to stay down for some time. That's, of course, affecting our farmers and everybody uh, around them. And that's mostly because there's an oversupply of food. It depresses prices, isn't it? If you've got you know, a lot of supply and low demand, of course, prices go down for any necessary economic good. And as I said, dairy incomes, when they drop, they have a run-on effect. And some parts in New Zealand will feel this more, more than others. And that is because their, their area, their region is more dependent, uh, or how's a better way of putting that, a, a nicer way of placing those words, would be that uh, dairy is more prevalent in that particular region, and as a consequence, there's more spending coming through the dairy incomes. So it has a run-on effect, and some areas in New Zealand will fill it more than others. Construction and tourism hopefully will go some way to offsetting that drag. Overall, we're in good shape, but inflation is low, and we need to get it up. And I don't think that this is anything new to most of the people that read my blogs. I've been talking about deflation since about August last year. One of the objectives of the budget, of course, is to get inflation up. And you've just recently had the New Zealand budget, haven't you? 2016 budget by the national uh, government. And their, uh, their focus was to reduce future liabilities. So in a way, they're trying to do that by spending uh, on health and to boost economic growth. And they're doing that by putting money into infrastructure, science and innovation. They've got some objectives. The first objective is to act now to reduce issues that's going to reduce uh, or, or going to you know, stop that drag on economic, future economic growth and invest in issues that's going to boost the growth and, of course, lift the inflation. They want to achieve a total sur uh, surplus of 6.7 billion, a uh, large number, by 2020, and they want to reduce government debt to 20% of GDP in 2020. What they're going to do 
if they get their surplus, is they go, they're intending to use about three billion of the of the surplus to uh, reduce our income tax rates, and we're all going to be happy about that, aren't we? Everybody wants to uh, pay generally as little tax as possible, and I guess that might induce us to vote national again. I'd like to see a show of hands here. How many people think that they would vote national again? Come on, don't be shy. Okay, I think I've got less people in this audience that would vote national than last time. The reason why I ask you that is I can remember uh, when a Labour government got in and I was just flabbergasted. And that is because all the people that I surrounded myself with were national people, of course. It didn't occur to me that anybody would want Labour in. So I'm asking that question now and trying to get a bit of an idea of where people, uh, people fit. And it does most certainly seem that Labour is becoming attractive to New Zealanders. Back to the budget, the highlights was a 2.2 billion uh, spend on health, and that is mostly to assist the district health boards, who've got quite a job to do due to the increased population that's coming through, and that population is coming through over migration, isn't it? 1.4 billion on education, and about 882 odd thousand is going to go into classrooms and new schools. Think about it: our economy grows through the knowledge that individuals possess, and that is why it's important to gain knowledge and to help our young people go through. 761 odd million uh, on science and innovation, and part of that is gonna go to uh, education and apprenticeship programs. Personally, I don't know why they ever stop them. When you look at, when you look at trade apprentice, apprenticeships, it was a great thing for this country, I believe. By the way, I should make a, a declaration here. Um, I, although I do have New Zealand citizenship, I wasn't born here. I'm a London girl and a Dubai girl. So when you come to a country like this, you're just blown away. You've got am amazing people, fabulous countryside. Um, generally, it's a very safe country, I believe. And one of the reasons why I came here is I, I uh, had the view that you could work hard and you could get ahead. And that was because education was freely available and you're seeing a lot of people coming from overseas and gaining an education here. And at that time, they did actually have the apprenticeship program. So if you didn't want to go to university, you could go and learn a trade. And I thought that was good for New Zealand because we had those people that were trained and qualified coming through the system. Of course, they stopped all of that. And uh, now we're left with a bit of a deficit. So they're going to actually start these programs wholesale. They're really going to start uh, pushing the trade programs through. This is something that every one of you should be looking out for. 857 million was given by the government to the IRD to upgrade their technology, and that is so they can ensure we are all paying our fair share of tax. From that 857 million, they expect to get an almost an immediate catchment of 280 million. And that is just on back taxes that haven't been paid. So make sure you're up to date with your taxes, that's for sure. 258 million is going to go on housing, and apparently that's going to provide another 750 housing places in Auckland. And 100 million is going to go for freeing up Crown land in Auckland for housing development. The assumption on this budget is that the forecasted uh, surplus will occur okay, on the basis that we're going to have economic growth of about 2.8% over the next five years, and unemployment is going to drop below 5%, and inflation is going to rise to 2%. And I've got to say, I'm not too sure that that's doable. <laughs> There's a bit of wiggle room now because if, uh, if the surplus doesn't occur, the debt repayments that we're meant to be making on this, on this GDP, getting this down, isn't going to occur until 2019. So if the surplus doesn't come about, there's a bit of room, isn't there? A bit of breathing space not to, uh, not to pay all of our debt down, or, or the majority of it. And also, from that surplus, we, if it doesn't really result or doesn't result in the number that they want, okay, then the restart of the contribution to the super fund, which was meant to occur in 2021, may not, uh, may not begin again. I don't know if that's such a great thing. Uh, retirement for me is not that far away. And I look at that and I think, well, I would, uh, you know, I'd like to make sure that the super is there. I'm always worried about that. Because we've got an aging population in New Zealand, more people are aging, and you think, well, there's, you know, there's just not enough sitting there now to cope. I don't know how that's going to happen when we all get another 15, 20 odd years to super. I don't know if that's actually going to be there. Another good reason for us all to get into property and provide for ourselves, I suppose. 
The couple of things when I was looking at the budget and analysing it, a couple of things that came to mind is I wondered whether it was better to concentrate on reducing that government debt, which is, which is you know, one of their objectives, using the surplus, or really to stimulate the economy and lift inflation. And I tend to think that's probably to, to stimulate our economy. Interest rates globally are low. You've got an economic outlook in New Zealand, which is you know, pretty blooming reasonable compared with the rest of the world. We've got very strong, uh, good, very strong economic credibility when, other co when compared with other countries. So I'm wondering why there's such a big push to reduce debt rather than to boost growth. I haven't, um, I haven't got my mind around that yet, and I haven't really seen any commentary on that yet. Maybe that'll come out in the next few weeks. To achieve that surplus, average economic growth, um, we've got, you know, we've we've got to hit um, a target, and there's challenges to hitting that target. Dairy, it's not going to really go anywhere uh, in any short space of time, that's for sure. Christchurch spend, well that's stopped now, it's almost stopped, it's really toweling down. So we're not going to get a, a lot of growth from that. The migration forecast is set to decrease. I know we've had record numbers, but we are expecting that to, to, uh, to decrease over time. And eventually, New Zealanders are going to hang on, I'm not going to keep borrowing and spending and consuming. I'm going to put some money towards debt repayment because I know how the tide can indeed turn. So overall, if that economic growth isn't reached, you know, the surplus isn't going to be achieved and some of the objectives that the government wants to push through isn't going to occur. Noticeably, I would think by everybody in this room, the budget did very little for housing uh, and the crisis that we are facing in Auckland. 258 million to provide another 750 more housing spaces. Well, where's that going to go? We've got a huge deficit. <laughs> and I ask myself when I, when I think about uh, how you might solve this deficit, whose task is it? Is it council or is it governments? Previously, to address the demand side of this equation, you all know this, the loan to value ratios were introduced. And that happened in October and November. And then the government, you know, just added a little bit of icing to the cake and they brought through the bright line test in October of last year. And as was predicted, okay, demand did indeed fall. But then you would really expect that, wouldn't you? You'd expect it over Christmas for sure. You'd also expect it that when new things come through, new, new legislation comes through on the books, everybody takes a breath and they go, and they cease for a moment. Now, if you're a GOA property school student, you know that that is your signal when that's about to happen, and we know that's about to happen again, we're pretty sure on that, when that's about to happen, that is the time when opportunities start. Everybody takes a seat back for, you know, a couple of months, and it's like, okay, now's the time to be moving. After February uh, this year, prices just surged again, as you'd expect. So it seems to me that the new policies haven't really improved housing affordability or availability um, or stabilised uh, demand at all. Done nothing for supply, but then I suppose it wasn't really addressed to supply, but it's certainly done nothing for demand. And of course the government is worried about that, so they've introduced what they call the National Policy Housing Statement. Okay. We don't think that uh, the housing imbalance that we've got at the moment is going to really solve itself quickly. We've got high migration, and I know that it's going to tail down, but right now it's right up there. Okay, those are big numbers that are coming through. 68,453,000, 000, I think I saw the number banded around yesterday. High migration. That's demand, right? You've got continual local and foreign demand. And you've got, to, when I say local, I'm talking about people moving from their region and into Auckland. There's a lot of that happening. You've got low interest rates, and you've got a focus for New Zealanders through really creating wealth for, their, for, for themselves now and for their retirement through bricks and mortar. And why wouldn't you do that? You're not going to do it in the share market. I got here in 85, and it seriously was the, um, the land of milk and honey. I can remember writing share scripts and things like that and thinking, I remember saying to my boss at the time, do they really buy this? He went, yeah, they do. <laughs> just keep writing it. It was just amazing. People were buying, going to banks, borrowing money and buying shares. It was all funny money. And then that collapsed. So New Zealanders thought, well, we're not going to do that again. And the banks certainly weren't keen to lend again on shares. Then you went through, you know, a techo age, didn't you? And all of that collapsed. And then you got through to the finance companies. And that was just a disaster. 
And now, of course, we're at the point where we know that if we can see it and touch it, we've got a really good idea that it's going to stay on our balance sheets. And that is why we move, uh, move growing wealth through property. Now, tax laws, of course, assist in that, don't they? We've got a ready availability of credit. You've got Westpac showing that right here. They're right at the back of the room for us to help us on that. There's a shortage of properties for sale. You are hearing agents tell you that all of the time. And we've already got a deficit in supply. We need 15,000 additional houses to be built, okay, and only about 9,500 are coming on stream. Not good. So as demand is going to continue, I can't see it, you know, shortening itself in the, in the, in the short run, in the, in, the, in the close run. And when I say that short run, I'm talking a couple of years. And the supply isn't going to come on tap on fast enough, then, you know, the only way that we can move this forward, I believe, and also so the government believes, is for them to get a bit involved. And they want to get involved because they want to make sure that Auckland does keep moving. This is the economic hub of New Zealand. We're expecting between 700 and a million people in the next 30 years here. So our our um, viability as a city from an economic perspective affects the whole of the long white cloud. And so the government want to make sure that our needs are going to be met. So they've introduced this policy statement and they did that uh, on Tuesday, Tuesday the 2nd of July, fairly recent. Um, they said that this is applicable to all councils, but in particular it's applicable to councils with high growth, high growth areas such as Auckland. And that statement legally directs the councils to provide sufficient, sufficient land for new housing and businesses to, to, uh, to match the projected growth, the surveys of projected growth that they undertake in their area. And then they have to measure and publish the impact of their decision on house prices. So now we're getting down to things like resource concerns, okay? important data. The tension, of course, exists because you've got council and you've got government like this. Building affordable houses, high density housing on surplus land while ensuring new communities are well planned and have appropriate infrastructure is just, you know, it's set for causing headaches all over the place, isn't it? The challenge is faced is council have got to issue consents uh, in a timely and cost efficient manner. I don't know if anybody's been trying to get subdivision off the ground, especially a, a reasonable size one, but it can take you ages in this city. Putting in and paying for infrastructure, okay. Nobody that is existing uh, in an area wants to actually pay millions of dollars levied through their rates bill for new subdivisions to be built around them. They say, well, we're already here. We're already paying for, for the use of the roads on our rates. Why do we have to pay for more? Availability of construction workers and tradespeople, they're like hen's teeth. Everybody went to Roo land. Then when some of them have come back, they've all been used down in, in Christchurch and Wellington. I know that stopped, but building projects are just mammoth in Auckland at the moment. Just look at, the, look at the skyline and you see the cranes. Get in your cars and drive around some of the areas and they are all building flat out. You can't find builders right now. There is, of course, a monopoly on what, uh, what constitutes acceptable building uh, materials, too, at, at, uh, at this point of time, and that pushes up costs, building costs. So it's very difficult to say we're going to build affordable housing when our cost of actual construction is moving. The government's responded to a lot of the arguments that council have put through, and they said, you either comply with this statement, or we are going to appoint commissioners to run the city, and if you have to, you sell down your assets in the city to actually make this happen. Overall, though, it's my view that it's doubtful that the national policy statement is going to bring down house prices. It might, if, it, if it kicks off, it might possibly slow the rate at which the price increases occur, but I don't think that it's going to just bring them right down so that we can all run out and, and buy a couple of houses each. And all this means is that there's more pressure on the Reserve Bank. And they are going to have to respond, and they will have to respond to get the growth up and the inflation up. Okay. So I think that they'll do that by lowering the OCR. Previously, it was thought that they were, they were going to maybe lower that you know, in, the, in the last round that's just happened. But I think that they're playing this wait-and-see game. The US uh, Federal Reserve is expected to lift rates. And when I say expected, you've got 50% of the poll over there saying, yep, we're going to lift. And then you've got the other 50% saying, well, labor data is not that strong, okay, and I don't think that we can lift. Or if we do, we're going to have to unwind the lift. Of course, that has an effect on our currency, by the way. 
So I, d I doubt that that's going to occur, but you know, I think the Reserve Bank is probably waiting and seeing that. Petrol prices have risen. The budget's provided uh, an additional tax of 10% on tobacco. And of course, infrastructure spending has also been provided for in the budget. So all of that should actually lift inflation. That said, okay, the New Zealand dollar didn't fall on the back of the, of the last decrease of the OCR. In fact, it was amazing. When an OCR decreases, you expect the New Zealand dollar to fall. And that is because you've got a decrease in the OCR, so the people that are actually buying up our dollars, the carry trade that is occurring, so just for those of you who don't know what, that, what I mean by that, the people that are sitting in Japan, that are using their money, borrowing at 1%, buying our dollars, pushing our dollar up, and then putting in the New Zealand banks on term deposit at maybe 3% or 4%, and making a couple of percent for the pleasure of doing that, sitting at, at home doing that, when the OCR goes down, of course you'd expect term deposit rates to go down, interest rates to go down, so you wouldn't expect them to be buying our dollar. Decrease OCR means decrease return on their money. But that didn't happen at all. In fact, OCR went down and dollar went up. And that is because there isn't anything else to buy. And if you have a look at what's going on at the moment, we've got a referendum in Britain tomorrow on this, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if if the dollar just moves again when the OCR decreases, because it's perceived to be a very steady and safe currency. Anyway, to increase the spending and the inflation, the Reserve Bank is going to have to act. And so it's going to be fa faced with this familiar dilemma, which has been really going on for some time now, first to ensure financial stability of a monetary system, and secondly to promote spending to increase inflation. If the Reserve Bank refuses to cut, uh, cut the rate, you know, the New Zealand dollar is going to keep continue to, uh, in, to rise, and inflation is not going to increase. So that's not, going to, um, that's not going to help our people very much, especially the exporters. But if the Reserve Bank does act, it's going to have little effect, I think. We've got low inflation, we've got low interest rates, we've got high asset prices, and that's sort of a world phenomena. That's that whole deflation argument that I'm talking to you about. The old monetary tools that we used to use, decrease OCR so everybody will borrow more and spend more, I just don't think they're going to work. Deflation is the new worry. If the Reserve Bank does act, though, it is pretty sure, I would have thought, only a personal opinion, but I think it's pretty sure that they're going to introduce a new macro potential tool. And they do that to ensure that you know, the consumption of credit isn't, isn't um, so either widely available or so widely uh, taken up by consumers because it wants to create this promotional uh, financial stability throughout our system. So here's some tools that it might possibly use. First of it could increase the LVR in and outside of Auckland. And I guess it will just choose. You know, if it's going to do that, it's going to choose. Right now we're at 30% in Auckland. Maybe it goes to 40 or 50%. Maybe it lists the regions from 20 to 30. I don't know. When it first introduced these policies, I looked at that and I thought, well, the fundamentals in the regions generally haven't changed. You don't have more employment going on. You don't have different industries going in there. And yet you're now getting price increases in property where you didn't get it before. And when you look at that, that's got to be about people flocking in and buying the existing supply and bidding up prices. So then you analyse the data and you say, well, who's doing that? And it's Aucklanders bidding against Aucklanders. That's what's moved their prices up. So all you've done is move the financial risk from, from Auckland down to the regions. And I reckon that that heightens the financial risk because you get to a point where supply, is, um, supply actually outstrips demand. And the reason for that is you'll get more developers down there that will build and build and build, and then you'll have people left with houses which they thought they might possibly be able to uh, rent or move, and they'll just kind of be sitting there. And you see it in every economic cycle when it, when it turns. You see that happen. So I don't think um, it's a smart move to just simply, uh, you know, increase LVRs and have a differentiation between Auckland and the regions, in my view. Borrowing in the regions is likely to be linked to Auckland security. So in actual fact, it's all interlinked. So how, you know, how smart is that? The next tool that they might introduce is they might require banks to hold more capital. And they did this when I was in, um, last year when I was in Port Douglas, this happened in, uh, via the government there. They, um, via, sorry, via the central bank there, they decreased OCR and it hadn't been passed on to consumers. And that is because government at the time had mandated that banks hold greater, uh, greater capital in their accounts. So 
That didn't get passed on at all. If banks do have to hold more capital, though, it is likely that the cost of that will be passed on to borrowers. The next thing, next tool that could possibly be used by banks is that might require a certain portion of mortgage principal to be paid annually. And you see this overseas as well. Very unaffordable for uh, generally for New Zealand borrowers. And of course, that will prohibit uh, a lot of interest-only loans to be made to borrowers. So uh, that's going to slow down growth, isn't it? Then we have possibly the debt to income tool being introduced or uh, sometimes called the uh, loan to income. And you would have heard of this uh, overseas. This is a very big thing in, in uh, my country in Britain. Remember, the Reserve Bank can only buy time for our environment to affect a change. It can't increase the supply of housings or decrease the demand. It can only buy time. Hence, the objectives of this tool is to slow down the pace of house price rises by reducing credit and to reduce financial instability if the banks have to take a hit. I think this is a, this is a, a smart tool in some ways, and I think it's a donkey dumb tool in another. It makes sense from a serviceability perspective because serviceability at the moment has got to be more important uh, than you know, the value of credential because we know that that has dramatically increased. Under this tool, banks tend to lend a multiple limit of your income. And I've put 4.5 there because that is kind of, the, uh, kind of the multiple that is used overseas. There's some problems with this. Okay, if I think about it from a tax perspective, and we're all good at uh, that at, um, you know, when, when we're turning our minds to tax to ask these sorts of questions. What constitutes income? There's no definition. What type of lending does it get applied to? In England, uh, investor-only loans are taken out of, this, uh, out of this tool. What's the magical number? Is it 4.5? Is it uh, 4.8? Is it 5.2? What is that multiple? What's magical? And how does it actually work? I mean, do you borrow in a really good year where your income is up uh, and that satisfies the banks? But then what happens when your income declines in the following couple of years? Because that can, that can occur with an economy. And if you have a look at, um, if you actually have a look at the average Kiwi income, they did, the Ministry of Social Welfare did a survey and they said the average Kiwi couple income, and when I say average, I guess they're talking about the whole of New Zealand, they're not just talking about Auckland, where incomes are a little higher. But if the average Kiwi income earns about 84,200, and they use a multiple, a multiple of 4.5, they're only going to borrow about 380,000. What do you buy in Auckland for that? I mean, I can't find a property for 380,000. And what that does is that increases the wealth divide line. And I saw this uh, very much so in England, especially with migration policies that they put in. You get to the point where only the wealthy can buy. It locks out a lot of people in the market. That is not a smart idea from a social economic perspective for a country. And it won't necessarily help the new builds because the number of people earning enough money to buy them is going to decrease dramatically. And so that really hinders additional housing uh, increased policies that you know, the, the council and the government are trying to work to put in place. And of course it pushes borrowers to other sources of lenders other than registered banks. And you know and I know that when you've got, um, when you've got people that are really desperate to get somewhere and they need credit to do that, they can often end up in the wrong hands. We see a little bit of that, especially in a frothy environment which we've got now. My question uh, is would the tool actually be effective in curbing supply uh, of credit and creating financial stability? Well, overseas data has shown that this is just not the case. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't stem the increase in house prices, but it does slow it down, but only for a short time. So I don't know if it's going to, I doubt that it's going to achieve its objective, that's for sure. To be really effective, uh, supply has just got to meet demand, it's just that simple. If they are going to put the tool in, then I suggest a buffer um, needs, to be, uh, needs to be applied uh, on, that, on that tool. And it might be, for example, that you, uh, you don't have a full equity, uh, but your income is, is really good, so maybe you pay a little bit extra. 
or maybe your income's okay, uh, but you have got good equity, and you think, well, and the bank thinks, well, I think that this is a good lend, okay, income's going to increase over time, the equity is sitting here with other assets, and they charge a little bit more. I think that they'll have to, there'll have to be some uh, manoeuvring around with this tool to actually make it workable for the different circumstances that we all face. Whatever tool is uh, going to be used, it is likely that a new OCR will be, uh, will be set. Uh, possibly, though, our bank is going to continue to play that wait-and-see game. There is data that they will need to uh, review to see how the economy is doing, and that data is going to be available in the next four weeks. What effect the uh, Fed's going to uh, have, if indeed it increases on the 15th of June, will be very much of interest, and also uh, what's going to happen in Britain whether Britain is going to leave the EU or not. And from a political and economic perspective, whatever Britain does, whether it decides to stay or whether it decides to leave, it is going to create some volatility in the market which will affect currency rates and possibly interest rates. Because remember, our banks borrow money from overseas. Uh, I think the Reserve Bank will also want to see how long this borrow and spend dynamic is going to uh, carry on for New Zealanders or whether they're going to get a bit realistic and start paying back debt. I want you to recall now that if, uh, if the OCR does indeed decrease, think this through. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be passed on to you, so you should indeed be making, uh, making tracks to decide how you're going to manage things if the OCR decreases aren't passed on to you or if interest rates uh, increase. And those are the risk mitigation strategies that we, all do, that we should all know and we must certainly teach at property school. First off, you implement a strategy to manage your risk in regards to interest rates before you need it, not after. You don't go to a bank and say, listen, I've been made redundant, uh, my house is on the line because I don't think that I'm going to be able to meet next month's mortgage payment, and by the way, my, my wife has just left me. You know, that's not a good look as a borrower. You get this stuff now before you need it. You go through things like interest rate tranching. Take a, take a bunch of uh, dollars that you owe the bank, maybe you owe them 500000 and you put it into different, uh, different amounts over different periods of time where you'll pay different interest rates, and then you'll average that out. And also revolving credit facilities. They're like great big overdrafts. I think they're great uh, facilities to have in place so that if you need them, you can draw down on them. Again, I, you know, I say to you, when an economy turns, when it tips into, uh, you know, pa past the tipping point in an economic cycle, when it's coming down into a, into a slowdown time, generally what happens is that uh, asset prices go down, and it's only if you're forced to sell that you suffer that loss. If you've got, uh, if you've got a, a revolving credit facility in place, you draw down, don't you, to give, give time time, so that eventually the asset price increases. I think everybody understands that, um, that concept. Developers use it a lot, and if you are involved in property or if you've got businesses where cash flow is up and down, then you should definitely have these things in place revolving credit facilities. Okay, no one's got a crystal ball <laughs> at all. If we had, then I wouldn't be here. I'd be probably sipping champagne on a yacht in the French Riviera. But my pick at this point in time, given the data that I've looked at, is I think OCR is likely to be cut in August of this year. That's my pick. I don't think there's going to be two or three cuts. I think that'll be your one, and then, uh, then they'll do the wait-and-see game uh, for some time. Now I want to move to structures because... There's a lot of people in this audience that are not GRA clients, so we've already seen that through the attendance list, and I just want to, uh, people that are, I want you to bear with me, this is a quick reminder for you, people that aren't, I just want to bring you up to date. When, um, when you are building wealth, you've got to actually think about how you're building it. The Reserve Bank wouldn't be thinking about introducing these tools if property prices weren't increasing, and the central bank is indeed right to be concerned. Okay. Have a look at these prices. Look at this. Auckland in the last 12 months has increased 15.4%. Hamilton, 26.2%. Have you got wages increasing at that level? Of course not. So there's a good reason why they're concerned. Will prices continue to increase? Well, migration is still flowing strongly. There is pent-up demand and it is growing daily. There's a severe deficit of housing supply. We know that. We also know that councils are going to need a lot of time to get their processes in place. 
And of course, we need the builders to come online as well. And builders are really busy. Interest rates are low, and what that means in my mind is that people want to consume credit and buy. All good factors for those wanting to build wealth uh, through property. And if you're going to do it, we would like to think that you will do it through the use of a trust or a company that is linked to a trust where it is protected. And so this is a concept that we have at Gilligan Road. It's called asset planning. And for those of you who are not our clients at this point, what we want you to do is we want you to put really a wall in. We want you to take all of the assets that are in your personal name and put them in structures, often in a trust, so that you move them to the wealth side of the risk wall. So if you own houses and cash, then they are at risk from creditors, relationship claims, and government means testing. Of course, if you move them over here, they are protected. We want that to happen. And Shannon's already given you an example uh, where, uh, where you know, uh, risk can come home through no fault of your own. I'll give you another example with a client of ours a couple of months ago. Uh, the, house was, um, the house was tenanted. The tenant uh, filled up their boat with petrol, parked it outside the house, right outside the house actually, because they were going fishing the next morning, a reasonable sized boat I might add to. So fill this boat up with petrol, park it outside the house. There's a problem overnight, and they have traced it back to, uh, to engine fault, but there is a problem overnight, and the boat catches a light, which starts the house fire, which then jumps the fence to the next door neighbour. And the insurance companies say, well, it's not our fault, it's the tenants, go after the tenant. Of course, it all goes through the courts. And then um, and it finds that you know, it's the, it, the owner has to chase the tenant. And the tenant says, well, if I had that kind of money, I wouldn't be renting your house. So now the owner is responsible for fixing their house and the next door neighbours. And I tell you this because claims can come out of nowhere through no fault of your own. Give me another example. Let's assume that you go and buy a house. You put some paint on the walls and some carpet on the floor. It all looks fine. You hold it for a couple of years because you don't want to be paying tax on, uh, on that under the Bright Line test. Then you decide that you're going to sell it. So you sell it to Mr. Smith, who happily buys it from you and lives on it for about eight or nine months. And then winter comes and he rings you up and he says to you, listen, this house leaks. You say, well, it didn't leak when I had it. I, you know, and all I did was paint it and put some carpet down on the floor. Not my fault. And he says, well, I bought it off of you. You wanted that it was, it was a good house fit for purpose of accommodation. I'm telling you it leaks as an 80 grand bill and I want you to pay it. And at that point you say, well, I'm not paying it. It's fine. I'll just attack your assets. And that's exactly what will happen. So claims can occur through no fault of your own. And that's just creditor claims. If you look at relationships, and we are in an age where there are a lot of second and third relationships, you know, if, you've got, um, if you've got assets in your personal name, then that is personal property, which of course is up for divvy when it comes down to relation demise. So relationship claims can attack to personal property. And then you've got your government means testing, which we will cover. So it's not smart to hold your assets in your personal name. Far better for you to move all of your assets to the wealth side of the wealth and risk wall. So best known protection no, uh, known to man and... and um, and woman and mice is a trust, of course. It's been around for hundreds of years. So you take your assets, which in this instance is a house and some cash, and you sell it to the trust. And the trust will then pay you for that by giving you an IOU. And you think, well, I've done pretty well here. I've got rid of all of my assets. But you have to remember that that IOU, that is an asset in your hands. So if a creditor comes along, the creditor is going to demand that you call up that IOU. And if you have to do that, then what that's going to do is that's going to force the, uh, the trust to sell the assets, put the money in a court bank account, and then that goes out to the creditors. That is not a smart place for you to be. So if you're going to sell your assets to the trust, you've got to make sure that your IOUs actually have uh, clauses in them which protect that balance. And by the way, this comes from the ANZ versus uh, Hawkins case. I think that occurred in 1980 seven and then on appeal 1989. So the first thing you do in your IOU, and by the way, uh, the legal name for an IOU is called a deed of acknowledgement of debt. The first thing that you do in your IOU is you put a Hawkins clause in there. And that says only you can call up that loan balance. And if you are a GRA, GRA client and I'm your professional trustee, these are the things that we do. When we check the uh, deeds of acknowledgement of debt, we make sure these clauses are there. 
It's one of the reasons why we don't like outside parties, outside advisors doing your deeds of acknowledgement of debt. So we put your Hawkins Clause in there automatically. The next thing we put in there is an entrenchment clause. Because the Hawkins Clause says only you, the person that sold the assets to the trust, can call for the balance of that loan under the IOU. And the entrenchment clause says when you call for it, you'll give the trust up to nine years' notice. Now, bear in mind, you're the trustee, so you can waive your rights to that nine years. If you want it and they want that money, you can get that immediately. However, okay, if you've got a creditor chasing you, okay, and let's say, and it would have to go to the Supreme Court, so we're talking thousands of dollars, but let's say they knocked out the Hawkins Clause and said, yes, Mr. Creditor, you are allowed to claim on the IOU. The next thing we would say as a professional trustee is, thanks, we've got your claim notice, we'll see you in nine years. Okay. Belts and braces approach from a professional trustee. Hawkins and entrenchment clauses are imperative. The alternative that you might have is you might gift everything to the trust. You won't sell it, you'll actually gift it to the trust. Okay. Now it's sitting in the trust. And then a lot of people have done that over time. But there is a trap. And I want to mention this trap because a lot of people have done this and they're wondering you know, what effect it's going to have. And there's some people that have yet to do this and are wondering whether it's a smart thing or not to do. If you gift everything, when you come to need a subsidy from the government, WINS is going to review the gifting you have completed in your trust. Now, gifting laws changed in October 2011. Previously, you could forgive debt up to the value of 27000 but a dollar over that and you started paying gift duty. In October 2011, they said, nope, you can forgive the whole lot. You don't actually have to pay gift duty at all. And there were thousands of New Zealanders that did that. If, however, you were a GRA client, you got a note to say, really think about it. These are the scenarios. Seriously think whether you want to do this or not. And at least 50% of our clients are still on annual gifting programs. It's because they don't want that gifting uh, clawed back. After the 1st of October, you could give everything in one lump sum. But there was indeed a catch. And the catch is really set out in detail in the Family Trust book. But I'm going to give you an example. Mr. Smith transfers his home to a trust. He receives the IOU, the debt back, from the trust of 450000 because that was the market value of the house. He gives 27000 annually, and after five years, he's completed you know, 135000 of gifting. He then wanders off to his lawyer, and his lawyer says, oh, look, you can forgive the whole lot, get rid of it. So he gets rid of lump sum gifting of 315000 now he doesn't actually have to go through the annual gifting program every year, and he's feeling pretty happy about this. But in 2027, some years later, he applies for a rest home subsidy. WINS do an assessment, and they assess his personal worth at 315000 and they deny him that subsidy. Now think about this. Right now, today, you're paying anywhere between 800 and 1500 a week for rest home care. That's going to come out of your assets, which ultimately mean it's going, to, it's going to really deplete what you can leave your kids. Most parents want to have paid their taxes all their lives. They want to leave their kids their assets. They don't want to have to hand it back to the government. When WINS assesses him, they say your 315000 is over our threshold. Right now, 1st of July, sorry, 1st of July 2015, you were allowed 218000 and that does go up at the annual rate of inflation. Now, bear in mind, Inflation's not running very high. So in 2027, when we had a look at this, 315,000 was way above the actual uh, proposed permissible legislative limit when it comes down to means testing for wins. So not smart to do all of your annual gifting all at once for a lot of people. And I say for a lot of people because there are some people in this audience where their value is too much and they're never going to be able to get through a gifting program during their lifetime. Moral of the story, lump sum gifting, not always the smartest idea, and that is why you have to go through this with a consultant. Talking of traps, I want to talk to you about estate planning, because that's another thing that people forget to do. Possibly because we've got a lot of family dynamics that have altered over the last few decades. We've got a lot of second and third families uh, interacting together. We've got people living longer and possessing more wealth. Okay. Estate claims are on the rise. And last year, through our courts, we had 325 claims. Now, when an estate has to go through a court, and it's the high court in the first instance, it causes your, uh, your beneficiaries or your intended beneficiaries a lot of tension and a lot of pain. Court costs are expensive. 
It is time consuming, okay, and the outcomes are always uncertain. So for that reason, it's important that you get your estate planning right. And this is where true asset planning structure and consultants come into their own. They think through the structures so everything is covered. Not just the trust, but your companies, your partnerships, your other out, out assets that lie outside of that. Your role is to be very clear in your instructions, but your asset planning consultant is to be very clear and detailed in the documents. Documents, of course, should be updated uh, where appropriate. And the one big thing that, these, uh, that a lot of claims involve is do it yourself. I see this on the internet, I see it in bookshops. They have these will kits where you just fill in the blanks. And invariably, okay, they create uncertainty and they end up in court, which is just plain expensive and time consuming and stressful and completely utterly unnecessary because wills are so cheap. They are cheap as chips. You know, they're like a couple of hundred bucks to actually deal with all of your wealth, which is often, by the time you've added up your house and all of your other assets, often hundreds of thousands of dollars. So surely you'd spend a couple of hundred bucks on getting that stuff sorted. And here is, um, here is a chart which I think that I will actually, because I'm not going to go through it, I think I will actually put that up on our website at Gilligan Rose. So that's a note to the GRA team to, uh, to really get me sorted on that in the morning. I think that would be quite good for people to have a look at because they often wonder what goes into a will and what goes into a memorandum of wishes. Here is a family trust and it's got assets there. What have I put in there? I've put a house, I've put life insurance, uh, cash and some shares. And the first thing that we would get under the estate planning uh, documents to be done is we would get our clients to sign a memorandum of wishes. And that memorandum of wishes says, when I'm dead and I no longer need this trust uh, over here, when I no longer need my family trust, I want you to set up trusts in this example for my children and split the assets out. So now I've got rid of the assets. Okay, They've gone out to the children's trust. They've gone from trust to trust. So if these children, and by the way, when I say children, we're talking 30 plus clearly, but if we've got creditors or relationship claims, these assets or the values of them, the money, monetary values of them are all protected because they've gone from trust to trust. They've never gone into personal hands, so they can't be touched. The next thing that we would do at Gilligan Row is we would ensure that you put a will in place because the will has to deal with your personal affairs. For example, uh, do you want to be buried? Do you want to be cremated? Uh, who do, you know, what do you want to happen with your jewellery? You know, maybe your engagement ring, you want to go to your, uh, your eldest daughter, uh, maybe your art your, or uh, your tools or a motor vehicle you want to go somewhere. That's what your will deals with. But another very important provision in your will is when you're dead, you can no longer hire and fire trustees. So you, you've given up. You, you know, the power of appointorship is revoked. And that's vital for you to pass that to somebody that you trust. Because being an appointor in a trust means that you have the ability to put in and take out the trustees, who in turn have the ability to put in and take out the beneficiaries. So if somebody gets into this trust that's not quite kosher, then there's all the other trustees removed, all the beneficiaries removed, and the assets returned to them. That's not a good thing. So you put the power of appointment, you transfer that under your wills. Not a difficult job to do, but it is a necessary job because otherwise you end up in a situation where your estate is muddled, uh, difficult to manage, and ends up in court. And we've got two of them right now uh, that we are handling for other practitioners through the firm. Taking care of your children, because this is for a lot of parents, this is what it's about, isn't it? You're here, you're building wealth. I know you want um, the wealth to give you options during your lifetime, but you want to pass that on to your children so that they have better lives. It's taken a greater percentage of income these days to purchase a home, and you think, well, that's a bit unusual, really, because interest rates have gone down over the last couple of decades. Have a look at this. This is a table that came out, and I think that this was on uh, CoreLogic and also on Bernard's site, Bernard Hackey's site on interest.co. I think that's where it came from. Medium house prices to medium household uh, incomes. 9.7 for Auckland. That's really high, supposedly. Not necessarily, though, when you compare other cities. And I think Auckland's just coming into its own. It's just becoming an international city. And when, into, when cities go through this phase, you do see that they pull away from the rest of the uh, areas within their country. 
and that uh, the multiples of income, high multiples of income is required to actually get into the market. And it's happened in uh, Sydney, Melbourne, all of the major, uh, LA, uh, San Fran, all of the major cities in the world, you see this dynamic happening and that's what's happening in Auckland. So in 2008, it took about 48% of a typical couple's take home pay to service a mortgage. And in 2016, it takes about 51%. And you'll say, well, that's not that much, especially when interest rates have gone down. But house prices have increased, haven't they? House prices have gone up dramatically. 88% is what the data tells us. And that means that you've got to save a bigger deposit to get on the ladder. Really tough when you're coming through with student loans and not, you know, six-figure jobs that's paying you. Uh, straight out of uh, university. Rents have increased as well, and salaries have not increased that much. You haven't seen a corresponding increase in salaries. So I've termed it the bank of mum and dad. They frequently come to the rescue these days, and we see it a lot through our trustee services division at practice. And what I want to show you here is if you are in this uh, boat where you're going to lend to your children, I want you to understand the dynamics and the steps that you should be taking. So here's a danger, and I was at the, uh, down in Wellington uh, working at a show about three weeks ago when this was, um, well actually I think there's a date there, that is June the 12th, that's when I saw it, June the 12th was in, uh, in a newspaper, and that was where parents had lent money, uh, and they were very much in danger of not getting it back. In this example, they loaned 422000 to their daughter and son-in-law, and those children then went to use the funds to purchase a North Shore home. They separated, the couple separated, the house was sold. The son-in-law alleges that the money was really a repayment of a debt that the daughter was indeed in, uh, was owed and was entitled to claim, and therefore he shouldn't have to really repay half of that debt, or indeed any of that debt, because it actually belonged to her, therefore it was personal property, then it became relationship property. The daughter says that's not true at all. No paperwork exists, none at all. So the question for the courts to answer is, is it a loan or is it indeed a gift? It's set down for a three-day trial and I can assure you it is incredibly expensive. If the parents lose the case, this is going to be the outcome. 830 was the sale price of the house, 26,000 give or take went into agent's commission, 1,200 in solicitor's costs. There is your surplus sale proceeds and the couple is going to get about 400 odd thousand each. The parents are going to lose the money that they've put in. But most importantly, they also lost the opportunity to invest that money themselves and to help their daughter again, because she's going to need help. It could have been a lot worse this scenario if a bank was involved and there was a mortgage and a guarantee sitting here. Here's how we recommend you do it at GRA. You set up your own trust, naturally, and you put the money in there. And then you set up a trust for your children that are buying, okay? and you loan the money. And when you loan that money, you put a loan agreement in place. Now, that doesn't mean you've got to call it up, but what it means is that you've got documentation there protecting that advance. Then what happens is the children go out and they buy a house, of course. Now, if the house gets sold, here's the same scenario, what would have happened? You still at your sale price, your agent's commission, then the money goes back to the bank of mum and dad. There we go, it's gone back there. You still at your solicitor's costs, less surplus sale proceeds, of course, for the daughter and the son-in-law to actually split, but the bank of mum and dad actually get their money back. That's a smart thing to do. I don't know how many parents are in, um, are in this position, but I see it quite a lot. Here are some lessons I think that parents should take. You only assist your children when your financial situation itself permits it. I have seen parents put themselves in peril when they try to help their children, which all parents want to do, but they actually can't afford to do that. You give your children a hand up, not a hand out. Okay. This is about enabling people to be contributing members of society and getting on with things. It's not about feeding them continuously. And lending should only be trust to trust so that advances are protected. Now, sometimes that's not possible. And I know that when children access their KiwiSaver funds. So I won't go into details on that, but um, you would be seeing, uh, seeing us about that uh, if that was indeed the case. The lending must be documented with conditions. So for example, a condition might be that it's repayable on demand. It doesn't mean that you've got to pull it up, call it up, but it should be repayable on demand. And the recipients of that loan advance need to make sure that they sign that loan document. And if that doesn't happen, 
then they can allege at a later stage that it's a gift or a beneficiary distribution. And if that is the case, there goes the advance that you just lent them. If you're going to act as a guarantor, I want you to strongly think about this. The guarantee should be limited, and the guaranteed amount should be written as a separate loan. The loan should have a short duration, not 25 or 30 years, a short duration. I like five years for our clients. And what that should do is that should permit equity to be built up in the property so that the refinance can occur so the parents can get their money out if they want to. So that's, um, that's how I would, uh, would deal with it as a guarantor. And if the loan is repaid, you want to make sure that you get a discharge of the guarantee. Because otherwise, if there's another loan that's written, you could be on the hook for that. Now, this is all about building wealth, isn't it? And it's either about building wealth for yourself. Okay, here's a little, um, a little joke that I saw the other day. I'm going to retire and live off my savings. What I'm going to do the next day, I'll have absolutely no flipping idea. Okay? That's not where we want to be. This is for the children, no. This looks promising. East side, hole in the wall, 2,400 a month. We want to get them out of that, don't we? So that is why we build our wealth through property. So whether it's for you and building for your retirement or helping your children, how I've been talking to you about, what you want to do is you want to try and understand why you're buying, what you're buying, and where you're buying, because that all helps you increase your wealth or increase their wealth. So you might want to come to our property school. It's one night a week for seven weeks, two or three hours a session, and we teach about one-on-one -on -one property concepts. You've got the three partners, uh, Matthew Gilligan, John Rowe, and, uh, and of course myself, and then we bring in expert guest speakers in their area. We're 450 uh, a seat in, in our schools, and it's 250 for a spouse and a friend. And I've seen people make great friends at property school and, and actually indeed even work together on property dealings. So what they couldn't achieve on their own, they've managed to achieve with somebody else in the school. The next two schools are in July and August, and if you want to go, then all you've got to do is fill out the form which you should have in front of you. You can't practice what you don't know. By the way, one of our speakers is Matthew Gilligan. There'll be a lot of people that already know Matthew. He's written a couple of books, and those books are available for you to procure tonight as well, should you wish. So property school gives you the knowledge, which of course helps you make optimal buying decisions. Those are the sorts of things that we teach you. It's smart. It's smart 101 concepts. And I say 101 because for me and for a lot of our speakers, we think that it's really elementary. But in actual fact, people come through and they say, oh, I didn't know that. Okay, I didn't know that I could do that. Or I thought about that, but I wasn't too sure how that worked. So maybe it's not that 101. I, I do know that it definitely works. How many property, have I got any property school students here at all? Any at all? One, a couple over here, a couple down here. Well. I know that you're, um, you're not available to come up here and actually give testimonies, but go to, um, go to our table and have a read of the testimonies on the back of the brochures or have a look at our websites and you'll see what people really think about it. They're, um, they're honest testimonies sitting there. Here is the uh, brochure. If you, want to, if you want to go, just um, simply fill it out and I can see in the front rows you've all got a brochure. Oh, I want to tell you about this. This is actually an investment property that I was given this morning by a company called Property Ventures, which Gilligan Row does indeed own 50% of. Now, the reason why I want to tell you this is this is the sort of thing that gets shown at property school. This could be even an investment property for yourselves, for, for your retirement, or for your children. Freehold land uh, with a house on it. Double garage, three bedrooms. Closest to the um, newest mall in Auckland that's just been built. I think that was built uh, last year. This is it's a great property. I'm going to show you some photos of it in a minute. Heat pump, HRV system, alarm. It's already installed, so it's quite tidy. However, when I looked at it this morning, I thought that's a smart property because you could actually do a bit to it. And what that means is that if parents are helping their kids get into this property, then clearly the property could be, uh, you know, tarted up a little bit, renovated a little bit more to a higher standard. That means it could be revalued, which means they could get their money out. Uh, alternatively, if you're buying it for yourself, then you'll build some equity. So there is the property there. Now, you know, if I was looking at that, I'd get right in here and I'd sort of I'd tidy all this up, tidy all this up. I'd be sorting out this, the front of this house here. But there's nothing that needs doing inside. Look at that. That's really tidy. That's actually quite a smart buy. And these are the sorts of things that you see at property school that's discussed. And you'd work the figures and work the numbers, as well as all of the tax and the finance structures and the property management 
uh, information that you need to make something like this work. So if you're interested in that, also talk uh, to, I think we've got, uh, we've got uh, Property Ventures at the back. Hello there. We've got them at the back, and they will, uh, they will indeed help you with that. Now, I'm going to run through some uh, quick legal cases that have come up in the last little while, and then I'm going to close. Here's some topical legal issues that we are facing. First off, protecting trust advances. This was a very smart bulletin put out, with, um, put out by uh, a lawyer. And we've, we uh, have practiced this for years at Gilligan Row. There's a lot of people in this audience, though, that are not our clients, okay, so I want to show you this. If a bank lends you money, it takes security. So I think that you should take security, too, if your trust is lending money to your company. More importantly, or equally importantly, I should say, if you are lending money to your company, you should take security. So those are shareholder current advances. And if you're at Gilligan Row, we look for this all the time. Have a look at this. The family trust lends the company 300,000. And the company's got some creditors, 200,000. And when it has a problem and it goes into liquidation or receivership, okay, the only money that's going back to the family trust is 100 and 200 out to the creditors. There's the 300. And that is because the trust, when it lent the money, had no loan agreement in place whatsoever. The advances are totally, utterly unsecured. You wouldn't just go out and throw money away. If you want to throw 300,000 away, throw it in my direction. I like it. I'll use it. Far better for you to do this. Have your family trust lend 300,000 down to your company. Same scenario. Let's say that the company does indeed go into receivership or liquidation. What's going to happen in a scenario like that is the receiver or the liquidator, he's going to give the 300000 back to the family trust. And that is because we would have ensured that a loan agreement and a general security agreement was put in place at the time of the advance. Now, when that happens, the trust moves from being an unsecured creditor to a secured creditor, and the wealth is protected. When you are at GRA... One of our jobs as financial accountants is we look at those statements, and if, if I'm um, your professional trustee, I'm looking at those statements, I'm writing to you, and I say, these are the advances that are made. Loan agreements need to be put in place with GSAs. You don't take the chance where things are unprotected. You put these things in place, loan agreements and GSAs. Next, I want to talk to you about equity because we've had a huge increase in property prices. Assets over time increase in value. And clients often think that because the, com the assets are in their companies, their, um, their LTCs, those, uh, or, or even ordinary companies, they think that those uh, increases in value are all protected. However, clients tend to own shares in their own personal capacity in those companies. So the increased value in those assets, in the houses going up, for example, is exposed to their personal risk. So again, when we are looking at the statements and we are talking to you when we're doing your financial statements, okay, we say to you, maybe you should be assigning the increased equity to your trust. Family trust, got a house and a loan uh, from Westpac to buy that. It's got an LTC, you've, uh, let's say this is you, you've got your LTC and you've got your rental in there, okay, and that rental has got a mortgage from ASB. You own the shares, by the way. And the, when you bought this property, it was 430 or 1,000 in 2013. But roll forward to 2016, and it's now 750,000. So there's a 320,000 equity increase. That's in your personal hands as a shareholder. So your job, your mission, is to assign it to the family trust. Now, if anybody comes at you, you've got nothing. Sure, you own the shares but the house has got debt by the ASB and the rest of the equity is held up here in the family trust. There is nothing to attack. People miss this. Advisors miss this. And I think they miss it because when you talk to your accountants, generally accountants are all about numbers. They're about bringing down your tax. And when you talk to lawyers, okay, they don't know anything about tax. That, that's not what, what they're trained for at all. They're about risk protection. And what you want is you want really somebody that's got knowledge on both sides of the ledger. You want the numbers, the accounting and the tax, and you want all of the law. 
and all of the risk mitigation strat uh, strategies known and put in place so that you get optimal structures. And that's what you get at Gilligan Row. If you talk to individual professionals as to how they're trained, I, I know this because I did an accounting degree, okay, and we never even uh, knew how to word the, write, write the word law. And then a law degree, and, and especially in tax, we didn't know anything about numbers. Okay, so you need, it in, you need both degrees and one person sitting there understanding the whole, um, the whole picture, which is what we do. Okay, finally I want to talk to you about making uh, use of debt because I see this a lot and this will happen more so in the next couple of years. Frequently debt is held in the wrong entity uh, for the wrong amount. And debt can actually be very effective if you have a plan in place. And this is where your structuring consultant's knowledge and skill and plain street smarts uh, comes into being. So here's you, this is a family trust, it owns a house, it's got a debt from Westpac and it's got a loan of 150000 You've got your rental company sitting down there, which you own the shares in, and that's got a house, again the mortgage over the rental is from ASB. And that's got a loan of 340, uh, 40, 344000 over that property. What you would do is you would call up the shareholder's current account in the LTC, the company will borrow some more money, in fact, it will borrow 150000 okay, and that will then repay you the shareholder's uh, current account. So it pays your current account out. And you and then, in turn, repay the debt in the family trust. And you think, well, that's not that hard. And what's so great about that? Well, this is what's great about it. In the beginning position, where your debt is, um, is not uh, structured correctly, you've got taxable debt. You get an interest deduction on, on your debt of 344000 now, at 4.5%, and I've just used you know, that kind of figure, that's sort of where we're sitting, that's about 15 odd thousand. So the tax benefit of that at 33% is about five grand a year. But you restructure this debt, okay, and now you've got tax deductible debt of 494,000. You haven't got any more debt, by the way, you've just moved it from one entity to the other for a perfectly legitimate business reason. So there's no more debt, you still got the same debt, but now you're able to get a tax deduction on the 494,000 debt at 4.5%, so you're able to claim a tax deduction of 22,000, and the benefit of that is $7,335. Check this, look at this, from here to here, and it's every single year, you're getting another couple of grand. So that's being smart with debt, and again, we look at this when we're looking at your financial statements or when we're actually looking at you and you come into our firm and we're setting up structures, we look at your debt position. So that's a smart thing to be doing. It's also smart to be keeping, uh, keeping your eyes open with regards to your trust affairs. Creating a trust and simply moving assets into it uh, and then doing nothing and thinking that you've got long-term asset protection Everlasting asset protection is how I phased it, doesn't work. When you take an insurance policy out with an insurer, you review it every year. Okay, that's a smart thing to do, and this should be the same with your affairs. You've got to meet your legal duties as a trustee, and you should be having an annual trustee meeting. There's not any legislative list which determines when a trust becomes a sham, okay, and when you lose asset protection, but there are certain things in law which indeed indicate when the trust is about to become illusory or a sham. It's a moving target, by the way. And again, I will put this up on our, uh, on our blog in the next couple of days for you. But these are the different types of law and the different things that are considered uh, under these different types of law as to whether a trust is a sham or not. There's three cases that I want to tell you about uh, briefly. First off, the official assignee versus the Wilson case. An indicator that the trust is not a sham is where you've got a third person and they're independent and they're not working under undue influence and they're working in the best interest of the beneficiaries at all times. And Wilson versus OA was a case that demonstrated this. This was about a bankrupt settler and supposedly he was meant to have great influence over the other trustees who ran the trust as he decided. And I've got to say that when I talk to trust clients and I ask them questions, sometimes they have quite a haughty response. And it's like, well, what do you want to know for? Well, I'm your professional trustee and I have to ask you these things because I've got a bank loan document in front of me. So first off, I'm assuming liability when I sign it. But secondly, we want to keep your trust safe. We want to keep it from being a sham. So that's why we're going through this process. That's the answer to that. But you do have clients that really just want to dictate and say, this is how it's going to be. What this case demonstrated is that having a person who is not a beneficiary of the trust, who possesses the appropriate skill and knowledge, 
uh, and actually acts uh, as a trustee alongside you is of great weight because it gives the trust independence. And they're only going to be independent now if they can truly show that they're not unduly influenced. And that is why at our firm you have a, have a process to get through which will help you show that should the trust ever be challenged as being a sham. The Appleton case is the second case, uh, second to last case that I want to talk to you about. That came through recently. And that said that having an independent trustee alone won't save the trust assets uh, and won't save the trustees if they're not carrying out their functions. And the Appleton case was all about a solicitor who raised some concerns over a proposed transaction. Clients do this all the time. They walk into the office and they say, thanks, um, thanks very much for being my trustee. This is what I've decided we're going to do and I've signed all of that and now you're committed and just let's get on with it. Okay. You see it all the time. That's not how you work with your trustees. Quick phone call and email is how you should be working with them so that the transaction is being discussed and considered by everybody all at once. Anyway, this, um, this solicitor was really put in quite a perilous position and he raised some concerns about this. He said, I don't think we should be doing that. However, the trustee exerted quite a lot of pressure and the solicitor uh, buckled under with that okay, and the transaction proceeded. The deposit of 101000 was lost. And guess what? The trustee then turned around and sued the solicitor. And the poor solicitor was found guilty. Not the smartest place for the solicitor to be, but then he should have done something different. The case demonstrates several points. First off, independent prof professional trustees have got a very high standard of care to adhere to, and we are that. Okay? Our benchmark of care that's imposed on us that we have to show you by law is much higher than your benchmark that you've got to adhere to. We've got to carry out our office to make sure that we meet those duties. And if a conflict is occurring, and you see this sometimes with clients at Gilligan Row, they say, well, you know, you got a law degree, you act as a solicitor as well as the trustee. It's like, no, no, we're, we're different here, different. We're acting in different capacities. You never want to put yourself into a conflict, because if you do that, you can't be impartial. You can't demonstrate independence. And if the trustee fails to perform their duties, simply because they want to please the client, then they will go under. Okay. That is their undoing. And we had the exact same case, exactly the same, even with the same vendor come into Gilligan Row. It was on a Friday afternoon. I got a couple of inches of paper and I was told by the trustee, I'm buying this, it's settling, there's the agreement for sale and purchase, which I've signed. There are the loan documents and you will sign this and we will settle it. And I said to her at the time, I've got to read this stuff. We're personally you know, liable if, we're, if we get this wrong. We've got to read it. To which she said, my solicitor's already read it. I said, well, who's your solicitor? So she told me. And I rang him up and I said, are you acting for the vendor and the purchaser? And to which he said to me, no, 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 no. One part of my firm's acting for the vendor and another solicitor in my firm's acting for the purchaser. They call that Chinese walls and it is indeed legal, but... I mean, seriously, how can a firm act for a vendor and a purchase, especially if a conflict arises? So I said to him, well, we're not very happy with this and we don't want to go ahead with this. And uh, he said, well, I'll take instructions from the vendor. Meanwhile, I've got the trustee, our client, on the phone. And she's, uh, she's not happy. And she said to me, if you don't do it, sign that agreement and go ahead with this settlement today, I've been told that we will be sued. And that means that you will be sued because I will sue you. And I said, OK, well, um, let me just check. So I call the solicitor again and I say, are you going to issue proceedings? And he said, sure. I said, how long will that take you? And he said, oh, 48 hours. I said, OK, fine. Thank you very much. And I put the phone down and I sort of thought about that. And I thought, well, there's a motto at Gilligan Row. We stand behind our clients. We stand next to them. And if we have to, and they're making donkey dumb decisions, then as a professional trustee, our role is to stand in front of them. So we had, uh, we had a bit of a discussion amongst the three of us and the very next day New Zealand woke up to see front page New Zealand Herald of blue chip and within, uh, within 48 hours uh, the listing for it was stopped in Australia and within two weeks it was done and dusted in New Zealand. So that was a client that we saved and she, did, uh, she was gracious enough to send me an email and I opened it and there was two words, thank you. That's a professional trustee doing their job as opposed to the Appleton case where they just go, OK, the client's really upset and I just better sign it or else I'm, you know, I'm going to lose the client. 
you, you do right by your client even when, uh, when you're getting a bit of grief. Clayton versus Clayton uh, is the very last case in our book, uh, on our books, and I was at a seminar last night, and it is incredibly topical amongst us uh, in the trust profession. And I would think uh, it's a private opinion, I, I must admit, although I think the opinion is shared by many uh, of my colleagues, is the reason why we should never have abolished the New Zealand Privy Council. Nevertheless, we've got the case on the books at the moment. Uh -huh. Clayton versus Kaysen um, really denotes the trouble that you can get in. Other than having a skilled independent professional trustee who carries out their roles, it's important that trust documents are indeed reviewed and kept current uh, with the law. This is a case which shows very clearly, uh, under the latest judgment, that trust can be ineffective in protect, uh, protecting assets from former partners, from relationship partners when they split, okay, and possibly creditors if the trust documentation is not drawn correctly. Mr. and Mrs. Clayton, a Rotorua couple, married for 20 odd years. Prior to the marriage, a prenup agreement was put in place under which uh, if Mrs. C stayed for so many years of the marriage, she was going to receive $30,000. The trust was created by Mr. C during the marriage. He was the sole settlor, trustee, and principal beneficiary, all of which, I might add, is permitted by law. The trust actually held 28 million um, of assets, and a lot of those assets came uh, from Colin Clayton, who was the uh, father of Mark Clayton. So this is almost like intergenerational wealth coming through the trusts. Now, this trust held 28 million of assets, and uh, of course, uh, Mark Clayton refused to share this uh, with Melanie Clayton. Okay. So I'm not, um, I know we split, but you're not having any of it. The court held that Mr. Clayton held the sole power of appointment, that he could remove all of the beneficiaries and distri distribute all of the income and assets to himself. I know he hadn't done this for years and years, but they held that indeed he could do it. And that power amounted to ownership that the power had been acquired during the term of the marriage and therefore it was relationship property up for division. It is a landmark decision in our environment. It also discussed when, uh, when a sh sham and an illusory trust arises, but it didn't uh, rule on that because that wasn't the issue that the court was facing at the time. What this case denotes is that it's very easy to see how a trust can become a sham. Especially so when the settlers are the same people as the trustees and the beneficiaries and there's an independence, a lack of independent trustees sitting there. And there'll be a lot of people in this room that are running family trusts like that. So take note of this case. It's, it's watershed material. A sole power of appointment is something that a lot of other people will be holding here in this room, especially with regards to business trusts. A sole power of appointment can indeed be seen as relationship property and asset protection can fail. Here's what worries me. It's not a far, far jump in my mind that the official assignee, and that's someone that, gets, uh, that is put in your place if you're declared bankrupt, it is not a far jump in my mind that they could get into that position and say, you hold the power of appointment as personal property. We are now representing you. We're now in your shoes because you're a judge bankrupt. So that power now comes to us. So now we're involved in all of the trust affairs. In other words, the reason why you set the trust up, and I know you didn't do it immediately just before bankruptcy, but one of the reasons why you've done that, especially business people, is to protect assets against creditors. If the official SME gets in there and says, well, I can now do whatever I want because I'm holding this power in your shoes, Okay. then where's that for asset protection? That's why I'm saying I just don't, I'm, this decision is not right on so many accounts. But anyway, it's this, we've got the decision now on the books and it's not a far cry for that, uh, for that scenario to pop itself up. Points to take from this case, I think, is that you really must get yourself a professional trustee on board who's independent. They are not a beneficiary of that trust. You must make sure that those uh, trustees are carrying out their duties and you've got to check your trustee and your other documents on a regular basis to ensure it keeps up with the new laws and it doesn't threaten asset protection. So if you've got a business trust, this is a signal for everybody in this room, if you have, are you running a business trust or a rental trust, this stuff is stuff that you should be checking now. Here is your indicator list if, uh, for a sham and illusionary trusts. Lack of minutes and resolutions, 
No minute books. We see this on a regular basis. No evidence of holding annual trustee meetings, which you must do by law. Complete lack of beneficiary, asset, liability, and professional trustee registers. Non-existent financial statements, or if they, if they are indeed prepared, they certainly don't comply. Complete inadequate documentation with regards to transactions. No, no major transaction resolutions, for example, with companies or uh, corporate trustees uh, sitting alongside trusts. Rubber stamping of documents, no, uh, no, do no documentation of the decision process that's been occurring when they're going through buying and selling assets, for example. And one party trying to control all of the other trustees. That's a pretty dangerous ground. So if any of your, um, if you're sitting there thinking, mm, this isn't feeling very comfortable, if this stuff is on your trust, then I urge you to take a little bit of action. Professional trustees will give the trust independence and bring everything together. Problems get solved and issues don't arise because when you call us, we're trying to, to see a wide range of issues. Okay? The accounting, the law and the tax and the financing. We're looking at all of that stuff and going, what's happening here? Of course, they've got to have the right knowledge and they've got to have uh, the ability to carry out their role. And when they do that, it means that all the trustees satisfy their duties and it means that asset protection sits uh, against those assets and the trust doesn't become a sham. Professional trustees like us, we continually keep up with the law and if you uh, look at my office desk right now, you will see case after case that I've been busy reading for the last couple of weeks. We read on a regular basis and we download a lot of information and then say, does this affect our clients and how do we manage this? Uh, professional trustees like Gilligan Rowan Associates, these are the things that they do. Uh, there'll be a few people here where I'm already your professional trustee. This is the stuff that you don't necessarily see, but we do this behind the scenes all the time. For those of you who don't have a professional trustee, I'd like to think uh, that you know, you're looking at this list and going, hmm, maybe we should be having a bit of a meeting and getting our trust in shape. So well, here's some points to wrap up with. There's not a lot of growth happening in our economy at the moment. Okay. We've got dairy down and construction down, okay, but uh, tourism, sorry, we've got dairy down and the Christchurch rebuild with regards to uh, reconstruction down, but with tourism and increased construction, including infrastructure building, uh, should indeed be a buffer. You've got a lot of population growth. Uh, it is still expected to continue, although it will tail down in the coming years. Okay. We've got a housing imbalance, haven't we? Okay. And that's going to continue to exist with a growing population, even current population. That imbalance provides a platform for wealth creation. But to get, uh, to get good growth, to get good wealth building, usually it's over a period of time, and it starts with having a vision, a strategy, and some buying rules before you embark on buying something either for yourself for retirement or for your children. Education should not cease in your life just because you stop going to school. Okay. You've got to keep building your knowledge, and you get knowledge about property at property school. Your structures need to be put in place, and there'll be a lot of people tonight thinking, after I've just shown you those cases and those structures, I really need a bit of a review with, my, um, with, with your own uh, affairs. Structures need to be put in place, and for optimal benefit, you have to have a complete picture. And what that means is that you're not just looking at the asset protection, but you're thinking about estate planning and you're thinking about tax at the same time. You don't build your wealth to leave the door open for it to be taken from you. You use a trust, you get a professional trustee, and you make sure that it is run correctly so that you avoid sham trusts and losing everything that has taken a lot of time and trouble to build up. And if in doubt, you simply have a meeting with us. An ounce of prevention, very old saying from my grandmother, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. This is indeed our organisation. Okay? And these are the sorts of things that we can do for you. This form you all have. Okay? And if you want help, uh, for example, if you want to have an initial meeting to discuss your structures, or maybe you want to talk to us about accounting, your accounting needs, I think I showed you with regards to debt capitalisation, 
there that it's important to get the right accountant who's looking at these things. If you want to bring in your financial statements and have a meeting and let us review that sort of thing, talk to us about your accounting needs, you'd fill out that form. If you want to go to property school or have a trust review, or even think about appointing an independent professional trustee like us, you'd fill out that form. Well, I think I'm uh, just about at the end of it. I've got a couple of jobs left to do, I think, before I close. First off, I'd like to uh, thank my seminar partners at Crockers and Westpac. I'm very grateful for you coming forth and joining with us and sharing your knowledge and information to our audience tonight. I'd also like to thank GRA. We have two partners, Matthew Gilligan and John Rowe, who couldn't be here tonight, but they most certainly contribute to the knowledge that I've got, and so do our client service managers. We need to be appreciative of them. So John Heslip, Celeste Chan, and Anthony Strevens, they're great people to have on board, and they're constantly helping me and our clients. So I want to thank them, and I want to thank our staff uh, who's helped put on this event. We can't hold events without the GRA staff, so I'm really appreciative of that. And finally, I'd like to thank you. You've been an amazing audience. I hope that I have uh, I've imparted a little bit of knowledge, and uh, I want to thank you for your time tonight. You've been the best audience I've had all evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.